it's hardly a revelation to say that some crime stories generate more interest than others. Some crimes are simply too minor to be noteworthy, while others receive massive coverage but remain relatively confined to a local area. However, once in a while, there is a crime story that never seems to fully go away. While unsolved murder cases already tend to generate a disproportionate amount of interest from the public, these are cases that for a variety of reasons tend to leave a unique and lasting impact on the culture. Today, we wanted to take a look at examples of a few such cases, focusing on famous unsolved murders that have become the object of mass speculation and fascination over the years. Though the crimes that could make this list are potentially endless, these are just a few that seemed especially noteworthy to us. Before we get to our list, don't forget to subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. With that out of the way, here is our list of five famous unsolved American murder cases. On the night of December 28, 1956, 15-year-old Barbara Grimes and her 12-year-old sister Patricia went to a screening of the Elvis Presley film Love Me Tender. The Brighton Park Theatre, where the movie was playing, was about a mile and a half from the girls' family home on the southwest side of Chicago. It was an area Barbara and Patricia had traveled to on many occasions, having already seen the film 11 times previously. The girls left the house around 7.30 that evening, telling their mother Loretta that they would be home just before midnight. When they failed to return by 2 o'clock the next morning, Loretta called the police. Barbara and Patricia's disappearance prompted one of the largest search efforts in the history of Chicago. Police conducted door-to-door -door canvassing in Brighton Park, dredged canals and rivers, and initiated a ground search aided by hundreds of local volunteers. More than 15,000 flyers were distributed in the area, and thousands of people were questioned in the case. Witnesses told investigators they had seen the girls at the theater in the night of their disappearance, but hadn't noticed any strange behavior or signs that the girls might be in trouble. The only exception was a statement from some witnesses who said they might have seen the girls getting into the vehicle of a young man who somewhat resembled Elvis Presley. The investigation turned up very few solid leads in the weeks following Barbara and Patricia's initial disappearance, with many assuming that the girls had simply run away from home or that they were staying with boyfriends. This seemed to be backed up by several widely reported sightings of the girls in the days after they went missing. Though the Grimes family vehemently rejected this theory, they were largely ignored. It wasn't until nearly a month later that their worst fears would be proven correct. On January 22nd, a man driving on a rural country road in Willow Springs, Illinois, spotted something strange behind one of the road's guardrails. It turned out to be the nude, frozen bodies of Barbara and Patricia Grimes. Autopsies conducted on the bodies would lead to a significant amount of controversy in the case, as none of the three forensic pathologists could reach an agreement on either the time or the manner of death. The most widely believed theory is that the Grimes sisters died just hours after their disappearance, as a result of secondary shock from the cold weather. The time of death was determined based on Barbara and Patricia's stomach contents. However, other pathologists in the case disagreed, finding signs of violent wounds and sexual contact and concluding that the girls could have died much later. These discrepancies have never been definitively resolved. In addition to the problems identifying a time and cause of death, investigators discovered no real evidence at the location where the bodies were found. However, it is reported that law enforcement may have severely contaminated the crime scene by allowing volunteers and other untrained people to walk through the area. Though the police had several suspects in the case, including more than one who confessed to the murders, they later recanted these confessions and said they were only given as a result of brutal police interrogation techniques. This seems to be true, as the prime suspect, Edward Bedwell, gave several inaccurate details in his confession that did not match existing evidence in the case. In the years since, unofficial investigations have pursued a possible link between the murder of the Grimes sisters and several other killings that happened in the city of Chicago around the same time. Despite this, the murders remain unsolved and continue to be one of the city's most notorious cases of all time. In July of 1974, a nine-year-old girl made a terrifying discovery while out walking her dog in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Just yards away from the road in the race's Point Dunes, she found the body of an unknown woman. The woman is lying face down on a beach blanket, her body badly decayed due to insect activity. She was thought to have died two weeks before. 
When police arrived, they discovered additional grisly details. The unidentified woman was nearly decapitated, possibly due to strangulation, and had been killed by a crushing injury to the side of her head. Some of her teeth had been removed, as well as one of her hands and a forearm. There were also signs of a post-mortem sexual assault. Despite the grotesque crime scene, there appeared to be no sign of struggle, suggesting the victim either knew her attacker or was asleep at the time of her murder. Police also discovered two sets of footprints leading to the body, as well as tire tracks nearby. Numerous attempts to identify the unknown woman were unsuccessful, and police could not find any matches to nearby missing persons cases. As time passed and interest in the case grew, she became known as the Lady of the Dunes. In 1979, a facial reconstruction of the Lady of the Dunes was created out of clay. Though this did not lead to an identification, it did provide police with an image they could circulate in connection with the case. Multiple suspects were proposed in the murder investigation, including famed Boston mobster Whitey Bulger, but these links were never proven. The body has been exhumed multiple times over the years, both in hopes of finding new evidence about a possible killer and discovering the identity of the unknown woman. Perhaps the most wild theory about the case, however, is that the Lady of the Dunes was an extra in the 1975 film Jaws. This was brought to the attention of investigators in 2015 by Joe Hill, the son of horror author Stephen King, who noticed that one of the extras in the film's 4th of July scene bore a resemblance to an updated reconstruction image of the Lady of the Dunes. Jaws was filmed at the same time and relative location of the unknown woman's murder, and the extra in the film appears to be wearing similar articles of clothing to those discovered with the body. Though the theory seems far-fetched, it is just one of the many examples of intense speculation that the case has generated over the years. At least for now, however, both the identity of the Lady of the Dunes and her killer remain a mystery. On January 13, 1996, nine-year-old Amber Hagerman went on a bike ride with her younger brother, Ricky. The two set off for an abandoned grocery store parking lot near their home in Arlington, Texas. The lot had a makeshift bike ramp in it and was frequented by many kids in the local area. However, at some point during the children's time there, the unthinkable happened. According to an eyewitness, a black pickup truck drove into the parking lot, proceeding to pull a screaming Amber Hagerman off of her bicycle. The unknown abductor quickly stuffed Amber into the truck before speeding off. The witness called the police, and Ricky went home to tell his parents what had happened. A search of the local neighborhood began immediately, and Amber's parents were quick to call both the FBI and the local media. Over the next few days, the community waited anxiously for any news. Sadly, Amber's body was discovered four days later in a creek behind an apartment complex less than five miles away from her home. The cause of death was severe lacerations to her neck. The legacy of the Amber Hagerman case is definitely a complicated one. Amber's parents became deeply involved in the movement to create tougher laws on sex offenders, and their advocacy was partially responsible for a Child Protection Act named after their daughter. The act created the National Sex Offender Registry, a database containing information about convicted sex offenders in all 50 states that is open to the public. The first automated notification system for missing children, called the Amber Alert, was also named in honor of Amber Hagerman. In the years since, the alert system has helped to find countless missing children before a similar tragedy can take place. At the same time, however, very little has been accomplished in the actual investigation of Amber's murder. Beyond a vague description of the man and vehicle seen during the abduction, no concrete evidence leading to the identity of a perpetrator has ever been found. Sadly, the murder of Amber Hagerman remains unsolved. On the morning of December 26, 1996, the Boulder Police Department received a frantic 911 call from a woman named Patsy Ramsey. Her daughter, John Benet, was missing. She told police that she had found a ransom note on the spiral staircase leading down to her kitchen, demanding $118,000 for her daughter's safe return. When police arrived on the scene, they conducted a search of the house, but could find no trace of the missing girl, nor any sign of forced entry. Believing they were dealing with a case of kidnapping, the police only cordoned off John Benet's bedroom, assuming this was the scene of the crime. No precautions were taken to prevent evidence contamination in the rest of the house. Around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, a detective asked John Benet's father to once again search the residence to see if anything had been overlooked. 
This time, the body of John Bernay Ramsey was discovered behind a locked basement door that had not been previously opened by the police. The six-year-old was found with a nylon cord around her wrists and neck, her mouth covered with duct tape. Her torso was also covered with a white blanket. The cause of death was asphyxia due to strangulation, as well as a skull fracture, and was quickly ruled a homicide. The case quickly drew national public interest, not only due to the young age of the victim, but also because of the Ramsey's family wealth and John Bonet's involvement in various child beauty pageants in Colorado, where she had won several titles. At the same time, suspicions about the involvement of John and Patsy Ramsey in their daughter's death also grew. To begin with, the ransom note found by Patsy Ramsey was unusually long, and investigators believed that it matched samples of her own handwriting. The note, as well as a practice draft, were also written with a pen and pad of paper from the Ramsey's home. The content of the letter also led police to suspect that it could not have possibly been written by a person unfamiliar with John Bonet and the Ramsey family. However, this was never proven, and the practice of handwriting identification itself was challenged in court. Next was the unusual amount of ransom money demanded in the letter. John Ramsey claimed that $118,000 was nearly identical to the amount that he had received for his Christmas bonus the previous year. This seemed to again suggest someone familiar with the Ramsey family, but also struck investigators as suspicious due to the very specific amount. Even more bizarre, no attempt was ever made by those responsible for the note to contact the family again, further adding to suspicion that the ransom may have been a possible cover-up for the crime. In all, police found little evidence of an intruder in the home, but did find several clues that they believe suggested the crime was staged to look like a kidnapping. John and Patsy would remain the prime suspects in their daughter's murder until new evidence came to light seven years later. In 2003, investigators were able to extract enough material from a blood sample recovered from the crime scene to conduct a DNA analysis. The DNA did not belong to anyone in the Ramsey family and was revealed to belong to an unknown male not in the FBI's CODIS basis. The information led to Patsy and John officially being excluded as suspects. The Ramseys subsequently filed several defamation lawsuits against people and companies that had reported on the case. In 2019, new evidence in the case was reported when a 54-year-old sex offender named Gary Oliva confessed to John Bonet's murder. Oliva lived close to the Ramsey home and had reportedly written letters at the time of the murder confessing to the crime. However, this would not be the first time there was a questionable confession in the case. A similar situation occurred in 2006 when a man named John Mark Carr falsely confessed to the murder. Though there is more circumstantial evidence tying Oliva to the case, police have said this is not the first time he has been considered a suspect in the case, nor the first time he has claimed to be the perpetrator. So far, no charges have been laid, and the murder of John Benet Ramsey remains one of the most famous unsolved cases in American history. The murder of Elizabeth Short has endured in the culture like few other American crime stories. Its combination of brutality and mystery has made it one of the most well-known murder cases to this day, despite taking place over 70 years ago. Short lived in Los Angeles, California, where she is widely reported to have been an aspiring actress. She worked as a waitress and was known to frequent jazz clubs where she would often befriend many men. Short was last seen on January 9, 1947, after she returned from a brief trip to San Diego with a salesman she had been dating. She was dropped off at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles, where she was supposed to meet her sister later that afternoon. Some staff would later say they observed Short using the telephone in the hotel's lobby. She was also spotted by guests at a local cocktail bar less than a mile away from the Biltmore. Little is known about Short's disappearance, or the week leading up to the discovery of her murder. On the morning of January 15, 1947, a local woman named Betty Bursinger found the body of Elizabeth Short in a vacant lot while on a walk with her three-year-old daughter. Details of the gruesome crime scene would become the subject of unending fascination with the case. Short's body was fully severed at the waist and had been completely drained of blood before being placed. The upper body appeared to be posed, with the hands over the head and the elbows bent at right angles. The entirety of the body was also badly mutilated, and in several areas, flesh had been cut away entirely. Short's face had also been slashed from the corner of her mouth to her ears, creating a horrifying wound in the shape of a smile. The cause of death was determined to be hemorrhaging from the cuts to her face, as well as shock from several blows to the head. Short was identified using fingerprints from an earlier arrest for underage drinking, and the case was quickly descended upon by the press once her name was released. 
the sensationalism surrounding the story drew intense interest, and the nickname The Black Dahlia began being widely reported in the news. There was ample dispute regarding the origins of this name, however. Roughly a week after the murder, a person claiming to be the killer contacted the Los Angeles Examiner, saying that he planned to turn himself in, but wanted to let the police pursue him further. He also told the newspaper to, quote, expect some souvenirs of Beth Short in the mail. On January 24th, a strange manila envelope was discovered by a U.S. postal worker. It was addressed to the LA Examiner. Inside was a message composed from cut-and-pasted newspaper clippings that read, quote, here is Dahlia's belongings. The envelope also contained Elizabeth Short's birth certificate, business cards, photographs, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen on the cover. Much like Short's body, the contents of the envelope had been carefully cleaned in order to remove any fingerprints. Mark Hansen was a nightclub and theater owner who was also an acquaintance of Short's. Though he had a motive for her murder, allegedly having his sexual advances denied by Short, Hans was eventually cleared of suspicion in the case. Over 150 additional suspects were also considered in the investigation, but they too were either eliminated or considered to have insufficient evidence tying them to the murder. The investigation was further complicated by the many unsubstantiated stories about the killing that were circulated by the press. To this day, these stories have created lasting disputes and inconsistencies in the public record. In the years since the case went cold, hundreds of people have falsely confessed to the murder of Elizabeth Short some of them not even alive at the time of her killing. The tide of speculation in the case has never seemed to fully go away over the years, with various books, movies, and adaptations in popular culture all offering their take on the mystery of the Black Dahlia murder. For now, we can only hope that one day we will finally have some definitive answers. That brings us to the end of our list. Are there any unsolved murder cases you'd like us to cover in a future video? Let us know in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thank you for watching.